Okay. Um, and so, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. This is just a quick one hour event. Uh, we're going to have a, a guest speaker on. We have Sapina Pasha from Guinness Ventures, who's going to speak to us about uh, 100 day planning. Thanks everyone for joining us, Sabina. Uh, so that's just going to be 10 minutes. Then after that, we're going to dive straight into the pitches. So it's going to be five minutes for each of the founders to, to share their pitch with you guys. Uh, and we're going to put in a form after each pitch. Uh, so if you guys want to follow up with any of the founders, just fill out the form who you'd like to speak to. And then myself, Tom and Kerry, we will follow up with you guys and try to facilitate those introductions. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes, wait for a few more people to join. Okay, uh, I think we'll just get started now. Um, so yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, first off, we'll start off with Sabina from Guinness Ventures, who's just gonna talk about 100 day planning. Uh, so I'll share my screen for you, Sabina, and I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Um, do you think you can go to present mode? Um, is this not in present mode now? I think it's fine other way though. Um, so, so thanks, Bobby. Um, perfect. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Bobby. Really glad to be doing a quick presentation. Um, first of all, um, just want to quickly acknowledge, you know, it's it's really hard work pitching. Um, and and um, doing these kind of webinars. So just want to um, just say. Well done to all of those pitching today. Um, uh, just one thing I would say is, you know, finding an investor um, and a partner is probably making sure the relationship is right between your investor is really key. So hopefully they'll be there to support you through your whole growth journey. So, you know, best of luck to those looking for investment. Uh, um, yeah, hope, hope they find funding. Um, I'm going to start with a very quick introduction to Guinness Ventures and myself. Um, please go to the next slide. Bobby, perfect. Um, so Guinness Ventures um, is part of Guinness Global Investors, which um, is a specialist asset management asset management, which has about five million five billion funds uh, under management. Um, Guinness Ventures was founded about 10, 12 years ago, and we're a specialist EIS um, fund that uh, is sector agnostic. So we raise around 25 to 35 million a year, and we invest in around um, 10 new investments each year and, and probably around 10 follow-on investments. Um, we have around 40 portfolio company, growth portfolio companies um, with around 200 million of assets under management. And, and they range massively. So as I said, we're sector agnostic. Um, so we have Gravity, which is a, a trampoline park. We have a number of ad tech businesses. We recently invested in White Rabbit and Dragonfly AI. So we, we have a kind of huge variety in our portfolio. Um, and we typically uh, invest around one to five million in, um, in scale up companies. So by scale up, I mean companies with strong management teams, uh, businesses with defensible market positions um, and proven product market fit. And I, I think um, we typically look at companies with around one, in, one million in revenue. And I think that that's kind of really establishing that, that product market fit point. Um, and my background is that I worked at BDO for four and a half years in their transaction services team, um, doing diligence on mid-market companies before joining Guinness Ventures last year. So I sit on both the investment and portfolio side. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief overview today. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Bobby. Um, on 100 day planning and value creation plans, which I'm gonna do very quickly, just conscious of time. Um, and I think this follows on quite nicely from the presentation that Tim Marchant gave um, at the last sort of funding event, which was on diligence. Um, and I think one thing to really note at Guinness Ventures is that we really try and make sure that diligence isn't a tick box exercise. We want to make sure that the diligence we are doing can feed into a really effective 100 day planning and value creation plan. Um, and, and I'll kind of talk to you a bit more around what, what, what that means for us. So. 
we want to make sure that any recommendations that come out of the diligence can help align with the company's strategy to create a structure around a plan. Um, and, and 100 days post-investment can kind of be broken down into the elements on the page here. So be that the value creation plan, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second, diligence tidy up, which should probably kind of tax legal um, financial points, um, establishing strong KPIs that kind of coincide with value creation plan and, and, and you know, create measurable, um, achievable targets for the teams to hit. And then governance. So, you know, um, we like to make sure that our teams are supported by strong chairs um, and have kind of strong governance um, in place. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a bit of a summary of kind of what 100, day, 100 days post-investment might look like. Um, and then on to the next slide. Um, is more kind of what, what is a value creation plan itself. So if those kind of pitching and, and maybe you haven't heard of value creation plans before, it, it, it's a really an all encompassing plan that, that should really um, target areas across the whole business. And, and the management team should really be able to use this as a tool to help them measure progress and really create structure around um, the strategy. And, and I think the idea of a strategy, um, so the idea of structure here is really key because it, we wanna make sure that companies are accountable to the, the strategy that they wanna achieve and be able to break that down into kind of measurable objectives. Um, and, and with that comes, you know, strong KPIs, which I, I mentioned before. Um, and, and that's not to say that, you know, our expectation is that companies should have, you know, wide ranging KPIs immediately on investment. The goal is really to develop these over time and make sure that they're, again, not just a box ticking exercise. It's really valuable and insightful and can help teams make um, informed decisions. Um, and um, on the next page, um, I've provided an example of what a value creation plan looks like. And it, sorry, I, I'm, I'm definitely not going to read through this, but it's more kind of an example of what the structure might look like. Um, so we would typically break this down into kind of game changers, risk reducers, and, um, and kind of a catalyst. So, you know, business as usual. Um, so kind of, you know, successful expansion into a new geography, which was already in the plan risk reducers, which, you know, could be, um, you know, regulatory, com competition driven, or a game changer or a catalyst, which could be, you know, monetizing a new product that wasn't in the plan, um, or kind of supercharging growth by expansion into, into the US. Um, and um, so, so this is kind of an example of what it could look like. And it, and it really goes hand in hand with understanding and helping, helping the management team make sure that their use of funds is kind of strategically thought through um, and being able to break down the value creation plan into kind of action points. Um, and, and one thing I would say is, is it really helps, um, you know, the whole team, especially if we, we think about a value creation plan as being all encompassing across divisions of a business. It helps, you know, our whole whole team, you know, junior to senior, feel empowered and understand how they fit into the, the mission and the strategy of the business. Um, and, and a couple of points I would add, um, just as I, I know I'm kind of running out of time, um, is that we would normally add this in the, the board pack and kind of have this as a recurring conversation where we're always touching on it. Um, and then second, the, this kind of value creation plan isn't something that would, we would expect to be static. So it's something that we would touch on, you know, quarterly and, and you know, uh, adjust it depending on, on how the strategic objectives of the business change over time. So, um, and, and really this is something that should empower management teams and, um, and help them um, as, as they kind of continue on their growth journey post-investment. Um, I've included a couple of more examples. So, We'll just flash this on screen and then the following slide Bobby as well um, is more kind of an example of a, a kind of a dashboard of you know different objectives and and you know being able to track you know green is hit red or blue is in progress so just start with something you know uh, to flash on screen to show you what perhaps we might do um, and um, I, I think you know just to wrap up I, I heard someone say this recently and I thought it'd be quite apt to to 
finish this with is, is um, you know, the idea of, you know, as a business, you're, you're building an F1 car and everybody needs to be on the same page to win the Grand Prix. So if you think about kind of really engaging all, all parts of the team to be able um, to get involved and, and help the company achieve its strategy is, is really key post-investment. So uh, I think that's me out of time. So I'm going to hand back to Bobby. Hopefully I haven't run over too much, but best of luck to those pitching. Brilliant. Thanks, Emilia Sabina. That was uh, really, really insightful and nice little analogy at the end. I'm sure everyone can, uh, can enjoy the, the F1 side of things. Um, so we'll dive straight into the pitches now, guys. So um, it's going to be five minutes for everybody. There's going to be no Q&A because we want to keep this as concise as possible. But after each pitch, I'm going to put a form into the chat. And if you want to follow up with any of the founders, just fill out that form. Um, but let's just get straight into it. So James uh, from Plend is going to start us off. Do you want to share your screen, James? Yeah, great stuff. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so let's go to the top. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so hi guys, I'm James. I'm the co-founder of Plend and we're building a better way to borrow in the UK. So why do we need that in the UK? Well, because credit scoring is fundamentally broken in this country. If you're prime uh, and you've got a great credit score, you've got a mortgage, then you're laughing. You've got access to all the best products at rates between three to 10%. The problem is if you're in the rest of the, the bucket, the subprime, where you can only access rates of 39, 49% plus, we're talking credit cards, overdrafts, payday loans. Um, so they get a much rawer deal and there's not much, much room in the middle there for, for a better value option. Now, what's really interesting is a study conducted by Experian, PwC and ourselves around something called the near prime space. So these are 13 million borrowers that are just as reliable to lend to as prime, but they're unfairly misscored either because they've got inaccurate or invisible credit records. So you're young or you've just come to the country or you've got minor blemishes and mistakes over the last six years, but maybe your situation has gotten better since then. Now, this market actually adds up to 22 billion pounds worth of near prime loans that are currently being overcharged and that's projected to grow to over double that to 51 billion in 2025 so a massive addressable market to people who are reliable to lend to but currently are getting terrible rates so how do we write smarter loans how do we reach these people well to understand that you've got to understand why people are writing poor loans at the moment. And the problem is they're using bureau data and bureau data is impersonal and it's out of date. So you've got limited verification. It's limited to financial products, court data and some utilities. Uh, verifying rent and income, two of the most important data points, it's nearly impossible. They've got about 15% coverage of the rent market. If that, an income is just a red, amber, green status. Affordability is even worse. So all they do is they look at the, the average ONS data for the postcode that you've applied from, and they just assume that that average ONS data is what you will spend for rent, groceries, and bills over the life cycle of the loan. It's been proven to not have an impact on bad debt rates, and it's just a, a tick box that lenders are currently doing to satisfy the FCA. And possibly even worse than all of this is the fact that this bureau data is often up to 90 days out of date, and often the most risky or fraudulent activity happens within the uh, those months leading up to the load. So you've got a, a data blind spot most where you need visibility. So what have we done? We built the plan score engine. Uh, and basically, we pull in open banking data raw, we categorize it ourselves, we grade it ourselves, we run it through our own affordability engine, serve it up on our own dashboard, and it's been built by a team of machine learning and credit risk experts that's been trained at over 1 million companies and 10,000 bank accounts. So what can we do with it? Well, we can see your salary, your rent, your bills, whether you're paying those regularly and on time, right up to the point where you apply for the loan, how much you're spending on essentials like your groceries, your childcare, you know, your transport to work, things that you really can't cut back on in order to service the loan. But we can also see things like your disposables. So how much you're spending on pubs and clubs, takeaways, holidays, things that maybe you can pair back on to service the loan. And by doing that, we get a really granular personal look at affordability that allows us to write smart loans. We also get a great look into risk factors because we've built our own engine. It's not just things like gambling we can see, which is invisible to the bureau, but we can also see things like buy now, pay later, which is obviously overtaken uh, in the under 35 space. Credit cards is the main source of credit for, for young people. If you want to write safe loans into this space, to under 35s, you've got to have a really good view of buy now, pay later. And that's what we've got with the plan score. So 
Smarter loans means market beating rates. We can lend out at 10 to 25 percent, which is unheard of for the near prime space, and it saves the average near prime borrower over 650 pounds compared to existing solutions. It also means we can write larger ticket loans up to 10,000 pounds. We want to push that up to 20,000 after our first 12 months, um, and that's really important. This isn't payday lending. This isn't stopgap lending. These are loans that put you in a genuinely better place than when you started. Really important to us. Um, so it's fantastic. We have actually managed to secure over a hundred million pounds of debt financing already, even though we haven't uh, launched yet. We're, we're just about to next month, um, and it's almost unheard of to raise this much debt funding uh, that early. Uh, but we've managed to do it because Varen Gold has done a really serious DD on our on our tech, on our processes, and they say, yeah, you know what, you guys really can write smarter loans than the competition, and we're willing to back you with this much debt financing this early on in your cycle. So we've got the firepower to really get out there, start lending, and scale up really quickly. So it's really exciting. Obviously, we are a tech driven lender, but tech is nothing without a team. And we've got a fantastic team here at Plend. Really proud of the people we've put together. The team's even bigger than this now. But we've got 45 years combined of world class ex expertise in credit risk, open banking, and machine learning from companies like Wagestream, Lloyd, Zoffer, RateSetter, Crowdcube, EY, Deloitte, you name it. Uh, they're a great bunch, and they're a reason that the, the tech is so fantastic and that we're ready to, ready to launch and ready to scale. So, look, that's a really quick whistle stop tour of what we're doing here at Plend. If you're interested, get in touch and we can tell you more about the rounds, what we're going to do with the raise and how you guys can get involved. Thank you. Brilliant. Great pitch, Jane. Thanks a million for um... <laughs> his phone's going off. <laughs> Front of the class. That's my, that's, my, that's my alarm telling me to uh, stop my pitch. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak to you after class, James. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks a million for that, James. Re really good pitch. Um, so, um, guys, I'm just going to put the uh, form into the chat if you want to uh, uh, fill it out with anybody that you want to, to chat afterwards. We will um, we'll, we'll make that happen for you. Um, so, next up, we're going to hear from uh, Ray at, uh, from Multiview. So, Ray, if you want to share your screen. We'll get straight into it. Hello, I'm Ray Meadham, co-founder and CEO of Multiview Media. You are all one of the three billion single angle viewers who gets frustrated when the director cuts away from the action. Hamilton's about to overtake Verstappen and they cut to the crowd. Brian May's about to do an amazing guitar solo and they cut to the crowd. We've all been there when we've been watching content. So Multiview Media is a multi-angle player that lets you be the director. And unlike a lot of the competitors in this space, it's much more accessible because it works on all the devices. It's much more affordable in terms of content creation right the way through to content delivery. And it offers you an alternative to the current delivery of content in the, in the current ecosystem. We've already delivered a VOD player for historic content for the likes of Chicago-based JBTV, Tixer in America and Gary Newman, The Struts and Home. We're about to launch our live stream version uh, so you can go to Silverstone Circuit and switch between the camera angles as the cars are going around the track or if you go to a music festival being able to switch between the stages or even zoom into what's happening on the stage. And finally our unique technology means that we're developing a user generated content where I can synchronize all your mobile phone cameras together and create a multi-angle TikTok. Our technology is unlike others in terms of that they use picture in picture. We have developed a unique technology that allows us to embed our, technology, our player within third party sites, just as you do with single angle. So it can sit within your infrastructure direct to your consumers. Also more angles means more real estate, more real estate for sponsors. So we don't need adverts. And also it generates more data we can AI in terms of what angles you watch so we can feed you more information based on your viewing experience rather than just the single angle that you normally watch. And that data tells us that we have 20% longer viewer engagement than any of the current single angle providers. We have a variety of different business models. At the moment, we're working with Silverstone Circuit and that involves us in installing the cameras, the streaming facility, the 5G and the player so that the fans can interact and get a better fan experience. We're working with Robbie Williams at the moment in terms of repackaging his historic Nebworth uh, show. 
and we'll be able to deliver that in multi-angle direct to his fans. And we're also working with the likes of uh, Rock School, Pearson and Formula One in terms of delivering a white label player so that they already have production, they already have content creation, so they don't need an end-to-end -end solution, but they just want to use the multi-angle technology. Now we charge a fee for setting up this bespoke system, but we can also negotiate a percentage of the SVOD, the AVOD and the data analytics. So that gives us a very variety of different uh, income streams. We're working across music, sport, esports and education. We already have a lot of traction since we set up the business. We were featured at CES and awarded best use of tech. We've been approached by the Olympic Committee for Paris 2024. We're already working with Silverstone in terms of installing the Jumbotron. And we've recently returned from a trade mission uh, through the Department of International Trade in India, where we've had a lot of interest from the likes of IPL cricket. We already have secured revenue of over half a million on the books in the next quarter, and we look to generate over two million pounds revenue by the end of the year and start to complete the OKR milestones that we've already set for the business. But don't take my word for it. Look at some of the quotes from the people that we're working with. Seven years ago, Alex and myself actually had the multi-angle technology in the App Store, but the world wasn't ready for multi-angle and actually we weren't ready for the world either. But we brought Kelly Richards on board as part of our team. She's the ex-director of Apple and she worked with Steve Jobs on the development of iTunes. We also have Ty Roberts, who's the ex-CTO of Universal and the co-founder of Gracenote. So he's the metadata guru on our team. Claire Ritchie runs her own sports marketing company with extensive clients, including MotoGP and Toyota. And we have Lee Lam, who comes from a strong financial background to make sure that all the numbers add up. So we've got a, a scalable team who've got global experience and worked at the highest ends of the industry. So if you're a fan who wants to be the director of what you want to see, or if you're an investor looking for a solid return, we currently have 150K of EIS available We've just closed our SEIS round and Robbie Williams manager is one of those people on our cap table and we're pushing to get Robbie Williams to join the cap table as well. Um, so if you're interested in investing, then there's an opportunity there. Or if you're just a content creator who wants to increase your reach, your reaction and revenue and let the fans be the director, then please join us to disrupt the fan engagement landscape. Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Ray. That was a, a great pitch. Ray was mentioning to me that uh, if you invest in the company, you get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Robbie Williams as well. So something, <laughs> to, something to consider. Um, all right. Thanks, Ray. So uh, again, guys, I'm just going to put that uh, form into the chat. Um, and if, um, yeah, if you want to follow up with anyone, just please fill out that form and, uh, I, I, and we'll facilitate that. So next up, we have uh, Lee from Helpful. Lee, if you want to share your screen. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Share the right one. Have you got that? Yeah, looks good. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Lee Brown, and I am uh, one of the founding members at Helpful. Uh, Helpful is a fintech. Uh, fintech startup based in London, and we're creating payments for the new economy. We're redefining the way that people pay and get paid, making it work for businesses, people and the planet. So the problem as we see it, speaking to our many partners that we're working with, is that the, is that current payment solutions just aren't, they don't fit the digital now, let alone for a decentralized future. When it comes to micro payments, they fall short immediately with existing payment solutions. They're designed for larger payments with high associated costs. If you think about the likes of Stripe and PayPal, they're anything from 1.4% to 3.4% per payment they charge as a fee. And, and on top of that, they charge an extra 20p per payment as well. A cheaper option could be bank transfers, UK faster payments in this country. But again, depending on provider, that costs you 12 pence per payment. So what happens if I want to process thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of micropayments that are less than 12p, um, that those solutions just don't fit. 
And also the subscription models. We, we all know the subscription models for news, video, socials, and they're generally fixed recurring fees regardless of the content that you consume. So what happens if I only consume a small amount of content on those platforms, but not enough to hit the paywall? I'm either going to miss out and not sign up for the subscription, or I'm going to feel a little bit cheated. Helpful have a solution for that. And we, um, we're reinventing this payments model. Uh, and we've created a fully uh, integrated, customizable platform that can facilitate the movement of money um, in line with our partners' business models. And we can move money around freely, make instant payments, and payouts at a fraction of the cost. And we're working with different businesses in the new economy to address their payments challenge. Our go-to market strategy. So we've already launched uh, and integrated the platform in Scotland, and we're work, uh, working on a micropayment solution for the deposit return scheme. And essentially, in short, the deposit return scheme is a scheme that's going to come out across the whole of the UK by 2024. And in essence, you will pay, you will pay an extra charge on top of um, recyclable items like single-use plastic bottles, aluminium cans and glass bottles. And the only way that you get that back is by making sure that that container goes back into the appropriate channel um, and you get your money back. Now, we have created a full digital solution using our universal wallets to, to fund all the movement of that, of the money. Um, the wallets have been approved by the regulator, who are obviously regulating the whole scheme, and it's due for rollout later this year to 3 million adults in Scotland. Once uh, Scotland is kind of the proving ground for the rest of the UK. So once we proved it in Scotland, we're going to move down to the uh, move down to the UK. And by the time we get to the UK in 2024, we're looking at, you know, around 60 million adults with our universal wallets in their pocket funding uh, or, or facilitating the movement of these micropayments. This initiative um, and this the, the project started as a project. This initiative has actually been nominated for the Earthshot. Um, prize 2022 um, and the Earthshot was founded in 2020 by Prince William and the Royal Foundation and it's the most prestigious global environmental prize in history so we're very excited about that um, with more coming out in September this year. Uh, the rolling out strategy and, and how that becomes universal is that we're working with the, the different brands listed at the bottom of the slide there and we're working with those global brands identifying their payment problems and using our customizable platforms in order to address those problems. And that's a mixture of um, micro payments. It could be uh, changing, uh, disrupting the subscription model and generally just making, um, uh, taking away their payment pain points by, by moving money around freely and easily and also reducing costs for those. <clears throat> our journey so far. So the, the platform is uh, fully developed by us, built and owned by us. We've bootstrapped over to a, a million revenue in the first year, just from projects and sponsorship fees alone. Um, as I alluded to, we've, we've launched the Universal Wallets to power a circular economy in Scotland. And, it, and those wallets have been approved by the regulator. And we're waiting now to launch to 3 million Scots later in this year. And again, nominated for the uh, Earthshot Prize. Um, just to quickly come through the slide. So the one I want you to concentrate on is in the center there, the creator economy global value. This is widely reported uh, as the value of the creator economy, the, the, the economy that we're tapping into uh, hundred billion. And this is increasing all the time due to the, the ease of becoming a content creator and, and the ability to get your content out there. So big market for us to tap into. Our investment requirements, we're at seed round looking for 1 million, a valuation of 7 million pre-money. And there's a quick rundown of how we're going to use our funds. Um, the key thing, one of the couple of key points in there is B, B Corp certification and, uh, and operations for 12 months. Thank you very much for, for your time. If uh, we welcome the opportunity to speak to anyone uh, at greater length about any of that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Lee. That was a really, really good pitch. Seems like the business is getting on very well. Uh, really interested to see your bootstrap to to revenue so quickly. Um, so uh, next, we're just gonna, guys, gonna put that form in again uh, one more time. Uh, if any of the pitches have uh, piqued your interest, just fill out the form and we'll make some introductions afterwards. Uh, so uh, next up, we have Evan from Weave. So Evan, do you want to share your screen, please? Yeah, thanks a million, Bobby. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. So my name's Evan, I'm the CEO of Weave. 
there's a very simple problem that every beginner language learner encounters. They want to engage in a meaningful way with the language, but this is the only kind of content they can find. Unless you speak fluent Spanish, this block of text means nothing to you, and it's useless to your language learning. This was a huge problem for language learners until now. I bet even if you don't understand a single word of Spanish, you can understand this. This technique is called the diglot weave, and there's 50 years of scientific research supporting its technique and its efficacy in learning languages. That's what we do. We weave foreign words into English sentences so you can learn Spanish or any other language easier than ever before, while only engaging with content that you truly love and would have read anyway. We've made excellent progress to date, releasing 39 books in 11 different languages, which we sell directly to our consumers from our website. We've been a profitable business since month two in operation, with a total of 31,000 euro in revenue and profits of over 13,000. We have an average gross margin of 80% and with very little marketing spend, we have a customer lifetime value of 22 euro and a cost per acquisition of nine euro. We've also received a number of awards and have placed highly in a number of startup competitions. And we've done all of this with just our books, but just books are just the start. Introducing the Weave app, where users can upload their own book or access a library of all the most popular up-to-date books and weave them into the language that they want to learn and start learning languages by reading content they choose and enjoy from day one. We are the Netflix for learning languages, where we give the users full control as they can dynamically change the amount of translation of the text so they are always at the absolute perfect level for them. This means language learners of any fluency can engage with their language of choice and stay with it all the way to complete fluency. We launched our app to a closed beta of 50 users just last week, and they are loving it. Picture a world where every text is weaved into a secondary language. People across the world are seamlessly learning their second, third, or even fourth languages while they consume only content that they enjoy, moving the world towards a more connected, multilingual society. This is our mission here at Weave. It is also the perfect time for an industry-disrupting startup like Weave as an incredibly exciting time in the language learning space. The direct-to-consumer market is booming, led by Duolingo's incredibly successful IPO. The surge in optimism by edtech investors has led to projections that the edtech market will grow to $115 billion in just three years. We believe as education continues to migrate digital, we have a real opportunity to take this market. But who are the team to take advantage of this opportunity? My name is Evan and I have a degree in neuroscience and I'm passionate about education and innovating on learning techniques. Keen is a passionate polyglot speaking four languages who is obsessed with improving the methods of language learning. Oshin has a wealth of experience in translation technology, including translation services for Microsoft, EdTech Research and app development for Irish language learning. Previously co-founding another startup, Sinead offers knowledge from a finance and operations perspective. Ultimately, we are a team of four friends who love to work together and solve big problems. We are also assisted by a team of world-class advisors. Stefan Uyger, Eric Risser, and Dan Habs are all tech founders and know how to build large, scalable technology companies. Eugene Theodore is a professional storyteller and CEO of Saga Squared. He helps us bring the brand to life through the stories we tell. Sumi is our legal professional and assists on a whole host of legal matters. We lean on our experienced advisors a lot and have great relationships with them. They are integral to filling our gaps in knowledge and provide lots of strategies for scaling. Our roadmap over the coming months is very exciting. We've just launched our web app and are already collecting as much feedback from our users as possible. We are using this feedback to iterate quickly and are already discovering what aspects of the app people love. Users are already able to upload their own books and are loving this personalized language learning experience. We are currently in the midst of fundraising and hope to secure our round by the end of May. In June, we will hire two full stack engineers as we expand and scale our technology, bringing our core team to six. By June, we will secure the licensing for books that are not in the public domain and reach a 50 book collection in the app. By July, we will done have enough user testing to launch our fully native iOS and Android application to their respective app stores, and we will begin monetizing our application with a freemium subscription model. Our competitors include those who provide beginner short stories like Ollie Richards and the website Link. But since our texts are weaved and not fully in the language, we can provide much more enjoyable stories. Toucan are our main competitors and are also proving the validity of the Digot Weave technique by weaving the text in web browsers. Although we know that our product is superior as our content will always be more engaging and we offer our users far more control over their translation and ultimately more control over their language learning journey. Duolingo are our final competitor and are proving that education is trending even more to our smartphones. Although instead of relying on gamification and memorization, we deliver genuine fluency for our users. So what are we looking for? We are looking to raise up to 500K in pre-seed funding. We will spend this money on three core pillars for business development. The first is salarying the core founders and expanding our technical team with two new hires. 
Research and development is next. To automate the production of our weaves, we need to train an AI language model, and this can be expensive. Finally, we want to go after a patent for our technology so we can protect our invention. Thirdly, our marketing budget will be split between selling our books, which is a profitable section of the business, and acquiring new users for the app. Our marketing will compose of influencers and ambassadors that will carry the brand, as well as Facebook and TikTok ads. Our yearly revenue projections can be divided into app sales on the left and book sales on the right. On the left, you can see a graph of pre active premium members who will pay a monthly subscription of 12 euro per month. As you can see, with only 5,000 active premium users, revenue will top 720K, while book sales are expected to hit 135K over its four channels. By investing in us, you are investing in the Weave mission, a mission to make language learning ridiculously easy and accessible to everyone. As our tech expands, we will gain the ability to not just weave books, but also TV shows, podcasts, the metaverse. The opportunities are endless. Just from this pitch deck, you've encountered a number of Spanish words without any difficulty understanding our message. After only a few more times, you will be able to use each of these words fluently. Think about the global impact we could have with our Weave Languages solution. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Thanks, Millionaire. That was uh, a muy bien pitch. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> done. sorry. Um, yeah guys so again if you want to just jump in the chat the uh, the form is still there if you want to follow up with anybody um just fill out that form and we'll put you in touch with them so uh next we'll jump on to corey from uh vitra cash uh, so corey do you want to share your screen sure Can you see my screen? Yeah, fire away. Okay, perfect. So thanks for having me today. I'm Koray, the CEO of Vitra Cash. And um, since the inception of FinTechs, I've been a collector of credit and debit cards. That's a thing many people do. And um, it's a thing that actually has a great benefit because every single time you sign up for credit or debit card, you do it for a specific purpose. I just signed up for the Waitrose credit card, for example, it gives me 1.25% cashback, which I don't get with anything else, but obviously the restriction is just for purchases at Waitrose. So um, I collect all of those credit and debit cards and every single one gives, gives me a lot of benefits. But what I discovered is I don't use most of them. I use my main debit card, my main credit card, and all the others just very rarely. And I lose out of all of those benefits I could earn um, without even having to do anything. So um, on top of that, the next problem is also a lot of credit and debit cards and also other payment methods like mobile payment wallets are accepted everywhere. Um, the acceptance rates are really minimal for everything that is not Visa and MasterCard, especially if you go out, um, out of the UK. So we have come up with a solution, the Vitra card. The Vitra card is a debit card that combines all your credit and debit cards and in the future, other payment methods as well, and automatically chooses the best credit or debit card possible for every single transaction. Let's go back to the example I just gave you, my waitress credit card. I have it, but I don't carry it along because my wallet is already pretty full. With my Vitra card, every time I go to Waitrose, it would automatically choose the Waitrose card. For all other purchases, it would most likely not choose the Waitrose card because I have cards that have a much better, um, a much better, um, sorry, a much better uh, reward that I could earn. So the Vitra Choose algorithm understands my behavior. It understands the rewards my credit and debit cards can give me. And using all of this data, it can automate the selection process if you are in front of the cashier and want to make a payment. Instead of you having to make the choice, and instead of you having to carry all your cards along, um, it's going to be a computer like it always has to be. The global card market is um, expanding significantly. That's exactly what I meant with the inception of fintechs. A lot more credit and debit cards are created um, and products are created every single year. And all of them are great. All of them provide real value for customers all around the world. And that's why we have much, much more cards per customer since, um, since, since the beginning of um, 2016. 
our main competitors are Curve, Apple Pay, and Google Pay. And the differentiation between us and them is we want to put the focus on convenience instead of just slimming down your wallet. We want to bring a real value to um, a one to the one wallet you always carry around. So not just having to um, use one card and still having to choose inside an app like you do with Apple Pay, Google Pay, and Curve as well, but you have one card and you don't ever have to make a choice again. Our business model relies on interchange fees right now, but we are already um, implementing a couple of different revenue streams um, where we always want people to pay for what they get because we are not big fans of subscription services. We have launched in December after just six months of development and we have had a great reception already. As we thought, people are spending much more with our card than with anything else in the world. Uh, we have compared us to the best competition and even Revolut has a much, much lower spend per customer per month than we do. And that all obviously adds up to the interchange revenue we make. We also increased our waitlist significantly. And until now, we had an 80% conversion rate from our waitlist. Right now, we have 15,000 people on our waitlist and around 5,000 people using the app. Our roadmap includes getting our own licenses in the future, integrating open banking, cryptocurrencies, and additional payment methods like I just mentioned with mobile payment, wallets, and so on. With just a team of 12 people, we've come this far. Just imagine what we can do in the future. Our founders are myself, Florian, and Gabriel. So we are raising 3 million pounds, of which we have closed 2 million pounds already. Um, we are also live on Crowdcube right now and are going to close the round in a couple of days. So you can check us out if you're interested. And if you want to know more, just get in touch. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Corey. That was a, a, another excellent pitch. Definitely something I, I could see myself using. Um, I, I have too many cards to deal with at the moment. But uh, yeah, brilliant. Thanks a million for that. So um, last but not least, or sorry, I'll, I'll throw in the form. Uh, again, guys, if anybody wants to follow up with any of the, of the pitches, uh, just please fill out the form and we'll, we'll, we'll sort that out for you. Uh, so last but not least, uh, Jay from Ripen. Uh, yeah, good to go. Fair play, Jay. Brilliant. Thanks, Bobby. I assume you can see my screen then. Yeah, yeah, looks good. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for having me. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll end on a, on a, on a good note. Um, so as you can see on the screen, Henry Ford, the late founder of the Ford Motor Company, once said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Now, that mantra has always stuck with me over the years, and here's why. Many years ago, a group of psychologists described an experiment involving five monkeys, a ladder, and a banana. Every time a monkey tried to grab the banana, the psychologist sprayed all the other monkeys with ice cold water. It wasn't long before all the other monkeys would physically prevent any monkey from climbing the stairs. Next, they removed another of the original five monkeys and replaced it with a new one. The newcomer went to the stairs and was attacked. After replacing all of the original monkeys, none of the remaining monkeys had ever been sprayed with cold water. Nevertheless, no monkey ever again approached the stairs to try for the banana. Why not? Well, because as far as they all knew, that's the way it had always been around there. The same story is actually true for aspiring entrepreneurs. So lots of people want to start a business, but very few actually end up doing it. Last year in the UK, for example, uh, over two thirds of people wanted to start a company, but less than 0.1% actually ended up, ended up doing it. According to Forbes, some of the key reasons for this included factors such as financial limitations, uh, inexperience and a lack of confidence. But just imagine how much potential is wasted because of this. What's more, of the people that do start, less than 10% end up being successful. You can see some of the reasons why on the right-hand side of the slide. But fear not, that's why we're building Ripen to help solve these problems. Uh, Ripen is a platform for app inventors to validate new tech ideas with potential customers before they've invested any money or time into actually building it. Once you've proven there's demand for your product, we'll introduce you to collaborators and investors to bring your concept to life.
But of course, we also have to walk the walk if we want to talk the talk. And that's why we spoke to over 50 potential customers of Ripen before building it and discovered three key things that they wanted from our product. The first thing they told us is that they needed guidance and support on how to develop their idea and therefore digitizing the process from idea validation to the launch of your minimum viable product is a crucial step in democratizing access and ensuring people have the right level of support along the way. The second thing customers told us is that they want to have all of the support they need in one centralized place so they don't have to work with a variety of tools to get the job done. That's why we're building an end to end ecosystem which has everything that you need all in one place. The third thing customers told us is that they experienced a lot of barriers along the way. For example, we spoke to some women in the tech space who told us that often getting access to capital was quite challenging for them, despite having a product with proven traction and positive rates of growth. That's why we think it's really important to find creative alternatives to cash, such as equity exchange, to get you started at a much earlier stage of development. Now, Ripen is uniquely, uniquely positioned to provide a digital end-to-end -end ecosystem with the ability to exchange services for equity in your idea. Other competitors in the market can do one or two of these things, but certainly not all three. Oh, and by the way, the identity of the inventors will remain completely anonymous until they've got at least 30 people to validate their idea first, because why should the value of an idea be determined by who's had it? Our MVP, which is currently live at ripen.tech, allows inventors to post their ideas for the community to validate through voting buttons and commenting. We'll expand on this later in the year with additional free and premium features, including idea boosting and live discussion. This solves the first couple of problems, including achieving product market fit and the confidence to launch new ideas. Next year, we'll launch the Collaborator era, which will allow the platform to facilitate transactions between inventors and people who are able to make their ideas become a reality. Finally, following that, we'll launch the Investor era, which will connect the inventors and the investors together who can help fund their very early stage ideas to further the growth. We'll make money through charging for premium features and a charging a per fee collaborator and investor transaction fee. There are also opportunities through B2B partnerships and advertising. And if we forecast that we can build everything out by 2024, we'll be able to make almost 20 million pounds in revenue and 17 million pounds in profit by 2027. Finally, as our value proposition is based in value creation and altruistic participation, we believe we're perfectly positioned as a pioneer of the emerging Web3 model. In summary, we're asking for 400K to fund the next stage of our MVP and collaborator eras and have a highly capable team ready and waiting to deliver this for the world to enjoy. Our dream is to help as many road monkeys defy convention, climb the ladder and get their bananas today. My name is Jay, I'm the co-founder and venture lead of Ripen and I have two other co-founders, both Rob and Ben, who are perfectly positioned to help support the next stage of our growth. Uh, very happy uh, to talk to anybody about next steps and uh, I welcome uh, the opportunity to discuss this further. Thank you very much for your time. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Jay. Um, really interesting approach to, to product validation. Uh, and I think a lot of people on this call will take value from that. Um, so guys, for, for one last time, I'm just going to put the uh, follow-up form into the chat. If you want to chat to any of the founders who are pitching today, just please fill that out. And we'll sort that out for you. But um, that's the, the six pitches done for, for the event. Uh, I want to say a big thanks to Sabina. I think she's had to jump off. She's She's in Doha at the moment, running off the meeting. So, but a big thanks to Sabina from, from Guinness Ventures. Really insightful talking about 100 day planning uh, and really important for any startup. Um, and again, to all the, the six founders who pitched today, thanks a million guys. It was really, really, really good pitches, really enjoyable um, and very interested to see what kind of, uh, what, what areas of business you're tackling. Um, so just to let everybody know that this has been recorded. So. If you want to look back at any stage, maybe uh, rewatch the pitches or maybe have a look at Sabina's talk, uh, we'll upload it and we'll send it around. Um, so yeah, thanks a million guys. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. I hope, hope you enjoyed, took some value and, uh, and maybe you found some, some businesses that you want to invest in. Um, so again, uh, if you want to follow up with anyone, just fill out the form. Um, but thanks everyone. Thanks very much everyone, cheers. Thanks. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. All right. Cheers, guys.